Hello, PlatformCon attendees. I'm Brian Letham, and I'll be sharing our experience at Netflix of how we're building out a federated platform console to unify the platform experience for all of our engineers. We'll look at how we identified the need for a platform console. We'll work through a build versus buy decision process. And we'll look at how we developed our MVP. And finally, we'll see how we're actively rolling out this MVP to our users. Later today, I'll be available on the PlatformCon Slack channel, Platform Design, for any Q&A. The Netflix platform started in a familiar place. Engineers wanted to develop, deliver, and operate the set of services that power the Netflix user experience. However, over the years, our platform has had to grow rapidly to enable Netflix to scale effectively and to solve unique problems in creative ways. This has left us with a fragmented experience for our engineers. As a platform org, we've made it our top priority to unify this experience across all parts of the SDLC for all of our software and data engineers. Aligning on this priority across the organization has made it a lot easier to introduce coordinated efforts to deliver on this unification, alignment that has otherwise been difficult to achieve in the past without these coordinated priorities in place. To better understand how engineers are impacted by this fragmentation in our platform offerings, we underwent a set of customer interviews from which we identified some top customer problems that we want to solve. The first top problem involves managing multiple services and software. Today, users have too many tools they have to work with on a daily basis as they work across the SDLC to develop, deliver, and operate their services and software. Consider a user that has to go to Bitbucket to review pull requests to Spinnaker to check on their deployment pipelines, to Jenkins to check on their build failures, to our internal alerting and metrics tool to check their operational status, and to our experimentation platform to check our canary statuses. The list goes on, and the problem is only compounded when folks have to manage a fleet of services and are required to repeat these same workflows multiple times. The second top problem we want to solve is that of platform discovery. Our product service owners generally do a great job of documenting their tools, but the problem users face is in knowing that these tools exist in the first place so that they can in turn read the docs. There are two notable use cases to consider when thinking about this discovery problem. The first and more obvious use case is that of the new hire. They have just joined a new company and a new team and need to not only onboard with their team's projects, but also the tools used to manage those projects. Today, we rely on a lot of tribal knowledge that gets passed along to new team members when they join. The other interesting use case to consider is that of the tenured employee. The one that has been here long enough to know their way around and get the results they need to move their projects forward. But how does that tenured employee learn of new tools and platform offerings that could improve their day-to-day -day experience? Today, we rely on users opting in to a notification stream to hopefully catch an announcement relevant to them. If they miss that announcement, then their next best chance is to learn of it by word of mouth. Neither of these scenarios are great, nor do they instill in our engineers a sense of confidence that they're solving their problems in the most effective and efficient way. It was clear our users would benefit from a platform console to provide a common front door to our engineers. This would give them a single place to view and assess the status of their services and a launch point from which they could discover and reach the tools necessary to manage their services. From the outset, we had an architecture in mind of how we wanted to build our platform console. On the back end, we wanted to build on top of the success we've had with GraphQL Federation in the studio side of the business. There are some great articles in the Netflix tech blog on our GraphQL Federation story. But in short, GraphQL Federation allows users to spin up a domain graph service, or DGS for short, that exposes their service as part of a single federated graph accessible by a federated graph gateway. When a request is handled by the gateway, it delegates to the appropriate DGS to fulfill all the fields referenced in that request. For our solution, we felt that by investing in a GraphQL-based platform API to power a new platform console, we would be able to leverage that API investment to power many other experiences, including dedicated UIs, CLIs, and Slackbots. 
For the front end, we similarly wanted to be able to federate the solution across the many platform teams and services we would bring together in our platform console. The scope of this effort would just not be realizable by a single team, and we would need to leverage both the domain expertise and the code contributions of our platform providers, partners. Additionally, we've made a platform-wide bet on Hawkins, our internal design system. By leveraging Hawkins across all our platform products, we'll be able to provide our users with a consistent experience across a number of tools and enable more cross-tool workflows. To implement this solution, we wanted to do our due diligence to survey existing open source and commercial solutions, rather than dumping straight into developing yet another internal tool. Believe it or not, this is a bit of a change of pace for us as we have a track record of building bespoke solutions. We evaluated a number of both open and closed source tools to see if they would be a good fit. To start, we needed to establish a set of evaluation criteria, something we could use to compare potential solutions. For this criteria, there were two perspectives that we wanted to consider. That of the end user, the one who would actually be interacting with the tool. The other perspective is that of the platform partner provider who would work with us to build out our platform console. With these criteria in hand, we spun up local POCs of the tools we were considering and evaluated them against our user and provider capability checklist. Spinning up a POC and developing some sample plugins was a crucial step for us in evaluating what the contribution experience was like. In the end, we decided that Backstage was the best aligned with our use case. Backstage is an open source developer portal project put out by Spotify. We like Backstage because of the loose coupling between the front end and the back end, which allows us to easily integrate our existing backend solutions, including the federated GraphQL approach I described earlier. We also like how the UI technologies of Backstage align with our internal expertise. The Backstage React front end uses a design system based on top of Material UI. This is highly aligned with Hawkins, our own internal design system. Backstage uses a Webpack-based build that results in static assets that we can serve with our own gateway. And Backstage plugin mechanism is lightweight and unobtrusive. It enables a loosely coupled provider contribution model for our platform providers. So, Backstage is our best option for an existing open source solution. But how does it compare to building an in-house tool? one that's built using our paved road technologies and guaranteed to be aligned with our use cases. To answer this question, we needed a different approach than the evaluation criteria we use to compare external solutions. Instead, we found it more useful to break Backstage down into its respective pieces and evaluate whether it's something we could build on top of as is, and if not, what would it cost to close that gap? In other words, where could we get the best bang for our buck for our investment of development resources? This line of thinking is well represented by this Wardley map, where we identify the various components of our system and locate them vertically by how much they will impact the end user experience and horizontally by how much they're commoditized in industry. As you read the chart from top to bottom, components are broken down into their constituent parts, pulling out the pieces that are commoditized. Looking at the Wardley map here for our platform console UI, we break it down into the development of Nextflix Backstage plugins, which we can in turn be broken down into the Backstage plugin API and custom UI components we would have to develop. With this map, we can visualize how we are better off investing our development resources in our custom UI components rather than rebuilding the plugin and core APIs provided by Backstage. Projects like a platform console have a critical mass problem. The console needs to provide some minimally valuable content before users will incorporate it into their tool chain. We felt that with the engineer interviews we did at the start of the project, that we had enough material to identify critical workflows across the LSDLC that we could pull into our console. With this set of features in hand, we proceeded to develop our platform console MVP. Our initial goal with the MVP was to build a connected experience, one that would provide a common front door for a service owner to view and assess the state of their service across the SDLC, but then link out to existing tools to act on the information presented in the console. 
over time, as we move more of the experience of the satellite tools into the console, we would graduate from a connected experience to an integrated one, and eventually to a fully managed experience, as we're able to take advantage of the consolidation of workflows in a single tool. We are just coming out of the MVP development phase, where we've built a platform console that allows users to view and assess their software at various stages of the SDLC. From a federation and partnering perspective, we were successful in bringing folks from nine different teams together to deliver on the MVP goals. The software page that you see here is composed of a set of plugins that insert a summary card into the overview page, as well as more detailed full page where users can drill further down into the plugin data of their software. This is accessible by these menus on the left. When designing and developing these plugins, we were careful not to simply lift and shift existing experiences into our console, but rather to take the opportunity to rethink the experience and the value the user would get out of the data. To address the problem of managing multiple services and software, we introduced the concept of collections. With collections, a user can group together a fleet of services to view and assess their status together. We also introduced the ability to kick off bulk mutations for the services in the collection. This is a concept that does not yet exist in the other platform tools at Netflix. Finally, we tackled the discovery problem with the introduction of our paved road. With the paved road site, we not only pull together product documentation in a single place, but we organize it in a number of different ways to help engineers identify the tools that are available for the problems they are solving. Our first iteration with the paved road is that of a static standalone site, but we plan to weave it into our platform console to more deeply integrate the platform documentation with this corresponding running services. Now that we've developed our MVP, it's time to roll it out and get it in front of all our engineers. Let's take a look at how we're approaching that. The features and capabilities we've developed as part of our MVP milestone meet the desired goal of providing that minimally valuable feature set that users can use to view and assess the state of their software. However, what we found with user follow-up and new research is that this consolidated functionality on its own isn't enough to draw users in and break their established routines and habits around existing tools. They already know what they want to do. They know where to go to do it and how to go about solving the problems. Rather, we are looking to drive users to our platform by inserting our console into existing workflows or creating altogether new workflows. For example, one quick win could be to commandeer existing email campaigns and have them link back to our console to view and assess the status of their campaign. Similarly, we could insert our console links into build failure emails or other user notifications. We're also looking at creating altogether new experiences in our platform console, experiences that don't exist anywhere else. The expectation is that as we continue to drive customers to our platform console and continue to enrich it with new functionality, users will develop new routines and habits around our platform console and organically add it to their tool chain. This is an area we're actively thinking through and experimenting with right now. So as we work out how to engage users with our manage and discover experience, we recognize that we've only scratched the surface of the unified verb experience we can bring to our users. In addition to fleshing out these two verbs, we also are looking forward to how we can tackle the other primary verbs, create, modify, and operate. We want our platform console experience to truly be the single front door for our engineers. Thank you for taking the time to hear our story. I hope that by sharing our experience of designing and implementing a platform console, that you can learn from the successes and failures that we've undergone, and that you in turn can be more successful with your own console development projects. Later today, I'll be available in the PlatformCon Slack channel, Platform Design, for any Q&A.